Okay, so in today's video, we're going to talk about this thing called hypothesis testing. And we're going to look at the weights of M&M bags, peanuts, to be precise. And we want to find out if we are being cheated out by M&Ms. Okay, meaning they say, if you read the small print here, which I'll just tell you what it says, it says 50 grams. So it says that each of these peanut bags should hold 50 grams of weight. And I want to know if that's true. Well, what I do know is each of these peanut bags with all these peanuts in there, it's going to be impossible to get 50 grams, exactly 50 grams, every single time. Like sometimes I'm going to get 51 grams or 48 grams or 49.5. But this is talking about on average. And quality control people look at on average because the producers know, and so do the governments who regulate this, know that it is impossible to get exactly 50. So what's a reasonable or fair amount? And they say on average, it should be 50 grams. But if on average we get systematically something that's lower than 50 grams, then we know that M&Ms is cheating us and then they could be sued. And so in order to do it, we're gonna write a hypothesis test for this. And I'm gonna say that uh, the null hypothesis, H sub zero, where it says mu equals 50 grams. Okay, and then the alternative hypothesis, which is H sub A, or sometimes it's also called H sub 1. Well, if I'm going to be cheated, I want to know if it is less than 50 grams. Because if it's more than 50 grams, well, then I'm not being cheated. I'm actually getting stuff for free is what it seems like. But when we do this calculation, we're going to get a bunch of bags of M&Ms and weigh them. We will not know the standard deviation. This will be a mystery number to us. And similar to before with... Uh, t intervals, we are going to use what's called a t test as opposed to the normal curve, which would be a z test. We do not know standard deviation, so we're going to use what's called a t test. A, actually, more specific, a one sample t test. So there are assumptions being made. The first one is that each, each peanut bag is independent of every other one. So when I have my little peanuts here, uh, this bag, how much it weighs, is independent of the next one. And if you go to a grocery store and get a random sample of 20 bags of M&Ms, well, then this assumption is invalid because they are not independent if there are just 20 bags at the grocery store because there's probably, if the machine is broken, they'd probably be broken for all 20 of those bags and they're all close together. So this one is hard to sometimes get, this uh, is independence. The second assumption that's being made, oh actually, let me, one more thing on this, the way we get around this independence idea is we need this sample to be a simple random sample. Random sample. If we get a true simple random sample, which is actually quite difficult to do, then we can assume that each bag is independent. The second assumption that we're making is that the initial population was normal or n is bigger than 30. Well, we're only going to have n being 20, which is getting pretty close to 30, and it seems reasonable, this seems reasonable, that I my bags would be an, a normal distribution of weights. And so this is an assumption I make. We haven't met this, so I think it's reasonable. Okay, so uh, we're going to go and weigh a whole bunch of bags, 20 bags, and we're going to put the data, and I, magically it's going to appear, and this is data that I stole last year from my last year's class. And so if you come along and you put it into your calculator, you put all the values in as you've seen you do, then you can do statistics, one variable statistics, and you'll see that x bar, the mean is 49.52, there's 20 bags, and the standard deviation is 2.74. So here are our numbers from this information. So we want to now test the hypothesis when alpha is 0 0.05 at this significance level. Be sure to include your test, your test statistic and your degrees of freedom applicable and the p-value of your test. Lots to do here. So if we go to our formula booklet, here's our formula bo booklet. Here's our test statistic z score if we know the variance, but we don't know the variance. So we're going to go to our t statistic with an unknown variance. And when we use that statistic, which I'll pull up over here, oh, 
When we use this statistic, we can see it here, you must be aware of the fact that we've taken a random sample of 20, which is n, and so the sample we have is coming from this sampling distribution. We're going to compare this group of 20 M&M bags with a theoretical construct, construct of every other group of 20 bags of M&Ms and their weights, what it'll be. And that would make a normal curve with this standard deviation, which is called a sampling distribution. And we're using the central limit theorem to make this theoretical construct model. So our, t, our test ticket is going to be, if we do our computations, we're going to be t is equal to x bar, which I know is 49.52, 49.52 minus 50 over the standard deviation is 2.74 divided by the square root of 20. Now I've only written three decimal places here, but when I do this calculation, I'll use all of them. And when I do that calculation, I get t is equal to negative 0 0.7824. This is our test statistic t. Now what in the world does this mean? Well, what this means is if I have my t distribution, it looks normal-like, so I'll draw a symmetric curve like this. And I know this is 0. And this will be for degrees of freedom. n is 20, so this degrees of freedom equals 19. What it says is that this is 0. Somewhere here is negative 0 0.7824. And so with that value comes a probability associated. I can come along and find this probability here. I can do that by using my calculator. And so when I use my calculator, I'm going to go to my distributions again. So second, distributions. I want TCDF. My lower value is negative infinity. And I'm going to go to negative 0.7824. Oh, make it 37764. Degrees of freedom is 19. And this will be... So this probability, so what I found is that the probability that t is less than negative 0.7824 is equal to, from my calculator, I get 0.222. So this shaded area is 2.22, or 0.22. This also represents what we call a p-value p-value is 0 0.222. And so now we have our test statistic, t. Here's our test statistic. We have our degrees of freedom, which we've said. And now we have our p-value. The last thing it wants to talk about is our alpha level. Alpha equals 0 0.05. Well, now we need a conversation between alpha value and p-values. I'm going to say that for the next video, because that will be a video all to itself. Let us continue going. The p-value, and see, at this point, the p-value is high relative to alpha, which means there is nothing, this is not an unexpected result. Okay, so what does this p-value mean? And we know if we think about this, we had this sample here, and the p-value represented this area here and it was 0 0.22. And what this means, and this mean was referring to 50, and this was 49.52 grams. This is in context. What this means, assuming that 50 is the true population mean, then what I can say is this. I can say if the mean weight of an M&M bag is 50 grams, okay, if that's the null hypothesis true, then the probability of finding a sample of 49.52 grams or less is 0 0.225. So it happens to find this particular sample or less 22% of the time when I take groups of 20. This is not unexpected. This, oh. This is not unexpected. 
right? If I'm going to probability of 0 0.0.01, 0 .01, that would be unexpected. I like one out of 100. Would I get a weight so low? That's but this is not unexpected. I know that simple random variation occurs, and so having this kind of variation is what is expected. That's what the p-value means. And so, what's our conclusion? Well, we have to make sure we're conclusion in the context of this problem. Okay, so since since the p-value is large, p is bigger than alpha, it's quite large, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis and claim insufficient evidence that the mean weight of M&Ms is less than 50 grams. Okay, so since the p-value is large, meaning larger than alpha, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis and claim insufficient evidence that the, to support the alternative hypothesis, this alternative hypothesis. The same kind of thing as with a person on trial. Our null hypothesis in, in the United States is that the person is innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Well. The alternative hypothesis is the guilty part, right? So we assume he's innocent, and as soon as we get more and more evidence, which the further our evidence gets, the means our p-value gets smaller and smaller. It keeps going over here. We have more and more evidence to support the alternative of being guilty, and we do not support the idea of innocence. More evidence means it's further away from the tr what is believed at first. So, with more evidence, the mean, the test statistic is further away from the mean, and so therefore we start to believe in the alternative hypothesis. So, here is a full hypothesis test taken to you from beginning to end, and what the p-value means as well. Um, and so you must go through these steps. To start off with, you, to do a full hypothesis testing, you must write your hypothesis, null and alternative hypothesis. Name the test. Write down the numbers, your degrees of freedom, and your t for sure as well. I like to write down the formula and this, the substitution in this with the degrees of freedom. This way, it's very clear. It's probably overkill, but it's very clear exactly what you're doing. You must state the p-value, and then you must write your conclusion, giving because the p-value is large compared to alpha. It has to be with regards to alpha. We reject the null hypothesis, or we fail to reject, and this is important too. Notice I didn't say I accepted the null hypothesis. Um, we don't actually know what's 50, we just not know we just know that's not less than 50. We don't actually know what it is. And so we're very careful with the language. We either reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis, and then we make claims about the alternative hypothesis in context. There's more to come.